Dr. Todd's in the house. Dr. Woodard's in the house. Well, it's 1030 and it's time for more collaborations and uh, exchanges of information and brainstorming the human connection. Well, I hope everybody's doing well today. Today, our guest is Nick Estes, and uh, we're going to find out a lot about Nick. He's one of the more interesting characters that I've met in the last six months. And uh, we probably have more connections than either of us know. Uh, as I got to got to know him, we probably knows a lot of the same people and uh, have walked over the same track at different times and just our paths crossed, but we didn't maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, Nick, welcome to our uh, conversation here. And I want to begin by asking you to give us a kind of uh, elevator speech of who is Nick? You know? mm. So wh what's, the, what's the elevator speech by the time we get to the 12th floor? You've sold us. <laughs> well, I'll just uh, first start off by saying Hamantaki Api, Mlapi Chusa Api, Chante Washte. I greet all of you as uh, relatives um, with a handshake and an open heart. And if you give a native man the microphone to explain who they are, we could be here for three hours. So I'm that's just why I said the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just going to tell you I was born and raised in Chamberlain, South Dakota. And I lived in South Dakota up until 2012 uh, when I moved to Albuquerque. And now I um, am currently living in uh, Minneapolis. Um, and a journalist, historian, writer, uh, podcaster, um, and we have the Red Nation podcast, but also I will be starting a um, faculty appointment at the University of Minnesota in American Indian Studies. Uh, in the fall of this year. Um, and also, I am from, from the Lord Brewer Sioux tribe. Excellent. Excellent. Now, that doesn't in any way get to under the hood of who you are, but it gives us a chance to uh, little by the, the low ramp, uh, you know, the low ramp to getting to know who you are. And we will expand that over the, the course of this hour. I'd like now to go to kind of the reason that uh, you came up on the radar for this program, and that is your book has just been chosen for the one book series for the South Dakota Humanities Council. And for those of you who don't know, uh, before we, we have Nick talk about that, Jennifer, can you tell us something about what is the one book program and uh, why we should pay attention to it. Sure, thanks, Lawrence. Put me on the spot here, huh? Um, <laughs> I do that well. You know. <laughs> I, yes, you do, always. So, um, the One Book Program in South Dakota started in 2003. It was the same year that we started the Festival of Books. And our goal is simply to pick high quality, thought provoking, uh, fully discussable uh, books that we think South Dakotans will be able to relate to, to learn from, uh, maybe to expand their thinking, reflection. Over the years we've had, we've done fiction and nonfiction. We've uh, done a variety of different kinds of authors. They don't always have a South Dakota connection, but I would say about, you know, a third to a half of them had either a, a South Dakota author, South Dakota topic, South Dakota setting, um, and this year, of course, we have all of those things in Nick Estes's Our History is the Future. And uh, this is actually the 20th One Book South Dakota selection. So it's, it's uh, really exciting to have been around this long and to have 
a South Dakotan talking about a really timely and relevant and important uh, issue, giving context to things that are going on in the world in ways that a lot of South Dakotans might be surprised to find out that they need to learn a lot more about. Um, so, and I just appreciate the, the thoughtful and thorough and um, very unique and of course tribal perspective that Nick brings to all of this. So thank you, Nick. Good, thank you, Jennifer. I'm always happy to hear about books that tell people's stories who haven't, when those stories haven't been told before especially when those stories are critical to understanding oneself. You know, it's like, you can't, how can you tell the history of South Dakota and not talk about the history of native people? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, it's, I, I have a hard time. And when I, I occasionally run into people and over the 30 years or so plus years that I've been in South Dakota and somebody will say something like, I don't know, why do we even have to have reservations? And you go, how did you graduate from high school? You know, and, and you don't and you don't know, you don't know why there's reservations and you don't know anything about it. I mean, how, how is that possible? So that's always to me a commentary, not just on that person, but I mean, if I only that person said that, that would be one thing. But when you have a number of people who say that, you think, what were you doing in history classes? And, in South Dakota, you know, look at the land mass, look at the, you know, how the state, what, you know. So at any rate, it's, I'm happy to hear that, that uh, it's a one book selection because that means it creates a new opportunity for us to learn the things that we should have learned in high school, maybe in kindergarten, you know, so. So Nick, welcome. And we certainly can't cover the whole book today, but we, we want to like at least give people some thumbnail of the thumbnail sketches. You know. So let's start by talking about what the book is about. Can you tell us that? Yeah, I'll um, kind of work backwards a bit, um, kind of expanding a little bit on Jennifer's comments as well as uh, your comments, uh, Lawrence. Uh, and I think it's important to, I, I just throw this Axios morning. Uh, um, that came out was written by Black History Month, and as we know, um, there's you know a lot of teachers, uh, you know, um, podcasters, people in the media will be featuring uh, you know the kind of heroes of Black history as well as the history of Black history, um, which I think is fascinating and, and appropriate. But also, it comes at a time when there is this backlash in this country, and you have state legislators who are passing. Um, what they consider anti-critical race theory uh, bills that, but it's really about policing what's taught in the classroom. Um, and I think in the case of South Dakota, there was also recently a bill introduced um, that prohibits teaching anything that makes students, quote unquote, feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress, <laughs> which is really amazing language. Um, yeah, and just closed down the school. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and it's it makes me think about my kind of experience in public education. Um, you know, uh, in all aspects. You know, I never went to private school. Um, I you know I went K through twelve uh, was through public education. I didn't go to tribal school as as well. I did teach at a tribal college for a brief, a brief amount of time, um, but I don't remember ever reading the history of my own people um, or having lessons that were um, sincere about the history of the Ocheti Shaokhoi um, within the state that claims the name of our people, which is South Dakota, uh, which is kind of fascinating, right? Um, and so, the reason, you know, the, the, that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. I wrote it for my 16 year old self, you know, in, in high school, uh, growing up in a border town um, uh, south uh, in Chamberlain um, and not really knowing the history of that place other than through kind of what, what could only be described as an apartheid knowledge system between what my father and my, you know, grandfather and my grandmother were telling about the history of the Kulichasha 
um, or you know the Hunkpati people, which is you know from Crow Creek as well as um, Laura Brule. Uh, and then what I wasn't learning in school, <laughs> or even in the culture of a place like Chamberlain, you know, which also has um, a, a one of the um, the oldest kind of still uh, operating off-reservation boarding schools, um, which is the Saint, uh, the Saint Joe's Indian School, um, of which many of my you know family members have been uh, students there. And so that was really what I was kind of trying to write about in that particular area. You know, if we've all seen the movie, um, The Revenant with, uh, with uh, um, Leonardo DiCaprio, you know, he like crawls his way to an Oscar basically. Right? <laughs> um, but did you know that that's a real story about Hugh Glass that happened in South Dakota or what is presently South Dakota? or what became South Dakota. And that movie depicts an era and a time period, if you remember, it's very violent, right? We see the kind of ecological destruction that the fur trade brought to uh, the Missouri River Basin. And we see the kind of, the, the sexual violence that was perpetrated against indigenous people in that film. There's very explicit scenes. A lot of it is, in my opinion, over-dramatized but nonetheless, it gets to the heart of what was happening. And then the final scene, you know, of that movie, Hugh Glass arrives at a trade fort, which is actually in present day Chamberlain, South Dakota. But there's a cognitive dissonance between, you know, you didn't see like uh, the, the world premiere of, you know, the revenant in Chamberlain, South Dakota celebrating this history, right? Which I find fascinating. So there's this, there's this kind of dissonance between how a state like South Dakota and the people who live there understands itself and the actual history as it exists and it's and it's known. And so um, instead of trying to provincialize or to put indigenous knowledge kind of in this box in the safe, you know, like it only exists in Lower Brule or Crow Creek or on the reservation. Um, what I tried to do in this book is to say, what if we provincialize this already provincial knowledge uh, that the United States has has of itself, and say, what if, what if we understand the history of this land solely through the perspective of Indigenous people? And I got that perspective. That's not a unique perspective. I'm not doing anything like revolutionary or whatever, but I got that perspective from my conversations with Elizabeth Cook Lynn, who was born and raised like about 20 miles <laughs> from where I was born and raised on the Crow Creek uh, Indian Reservation. And she founded, she helped co-found um, a tribal writer society that I'm a part of, the Oak Lake Writer Society, um, of which, you know, Chuck Woodard, who's on this call, hi, Chuck, um, is, you know, is, uh, has been a, a longtime supporter and advocate for, um, but really the kind of perspective that I take in this book comes from reading the publications of the Oak Lake Writer Society, um, reading the publications of the authors from the Oak Lake Writers Society, but also being in conversation with our own tribal literary tradition, which is the Ocheti Shakoi, which includes the Dakota, Lakota, and the Nakota people. And that territory extends all the way to where I'm, you know, where I'm currently calling you from, which is uh, Minneapolis or the Twin Cities. And so the book itself uses the Standing Rock uh, you know, this, the, the protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline as a way to understand history. Like, and I think it's a very, you know, unique moment. I think um, Kianga Yamada Taylor um, wrote uh, from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, understanding the history of, you know, of, of Black movements in the United States through the lens of the Black Lives Matter protests, um, which I think, you know, I was trying, I was trying to do in, in some ways, um, of course, those histories are, are a bit different, but they're, they overlap, right? And so that's really what I was trying to accomplish with this book. And the, I guess the title itself is, um, you know, the, the, the argument is that our history is the future, meaning that, um, and I mean, it has multiple meanings, it could have a negative connotation, which some people have taken it to be to say, the genocide and destruction that was, you know, um, beset upon your people, maybe the future of this planet. And my intention was a little bit more optimistic to say that uh, indigenous people aren't, you know, only oriented towards the past, but we're actually oriented towards the future. And you don't really see that in the popular representation of indigenous people, how we're talked about 
how we're written about and how we're discussed. And so I locate, you know, I begin the book with, you know, the, the ghost dance prophecy and thinking about, um, you know, uh, Black Elk's vision uh, and how it's been distorted over time. And, you know, the, the book um, Black Elk Speaks was, you know, translated or transliterated by a, a white poet named John Neerhart but he changed Black Elk's language to say, you know, the nation or you know, the hoop, the hoop, the sacred hoop is broken, right? Uh, after the Wounded Knee Massacre and that we are kind of like essentially a defeated people. But Black Elk never said that. And if you go back to the original transcripts, you know, he was talking about um, the Tree of Life after the Wounded Knee Massacre saying, you know, it was definitely like, the, the tree of life and how we understand ourselves as Lakota people was definitely hacked, but the roots still remained, right? Um, and that the ghost dance prophecy, according to Black Elk, was something that was oriented towards the future. It wasn't trying to recuperate a past, real or imagined, right? And living in a utopic past, but to understand that the ghost dance arose as a response to the reservation system, right? Even the word dance, you know, in, in, in describing what was the movement itself, ghost dance, dancing was prohibited at the time of the ghost dance. And so that was an act of defiance. It was a, it was a modern protest movement, right? Much like being a water protector and being in prayer at the Standing Rock camps. So why is it that, you know, from 1890 to 2016, you have ceremonial, religious, spiritual practices that are considered criminal by not only the United States government, but by state governments. And in the case, you know, what also separates, um, you know, Wounded Knee from, from the Standing Rock um, camps is that there were private military, op, you know, there were private, mil or private security um, companies that were surveilling and you know infiltrating the camps and that had you know essentially categorized the camps as a quote unquote jihadist insurgency right and these were operators that came from america's um you know foreign wars on terror they had been deployed in iraq they had been, been deployed in afghanistan and they were using the same counterinsurgency tactics uh in the u.s war on terror against indigenous people who are unarmed <laughs> in prayer the standing rock camps and so that's really like the crux of this is to show that like, in some ways, you know, our history as a future has a positive connotation, meaning that the impulse for indigenous people, you know, throughout history has been a sense of freedom. Um, and that that kind of sense of freedom is always on the horizon in the future, right? Um, but it's also kind of a warning to say that like, what has changed from 1890 to 2016, you know, in, in the attitudes of, of this government. In that light, what are some of the long-term tensions that, that you have observed that kind of keep this idea, these feelings suspended and not let us move forward to that future? What, what are some of the tensions that, that keep that in play? So I think um, as an educator, um, something that I've always taught uh, when I've you know, taught high school students, but also college students, especially about the history of South Dakota, is I begin with the Constitution of South Dakota, which codifies the Enabling Act, which essentially says that the state of South Dakota has no jurisdiction and no authority over tribal lands. And so it's not so much a, it is an emotional thing. Uh, I think the tensions between indigenous and non-indigenous in South Dakota, but it's also a legal and a political issue, right? That in many, in many instances, the state of South Dakota has overstepped its authority um, in something that is within its own constitution. And so in many ways, uh, the indigenous movements, especially in the 20th century and the 21st century are merely asking the state of South Dakota to live up to its own laws and its own constitution. That's not a radical thing, right? <laughs> we can it all say be. that. It shouldn't be anyway. <laughs> and so when, a, when the governor says that she's gonna deploy the military or the, the National Guard 
um, to take down COVID-19 checkpoints, we have to ask ourselves, you know, under what authority, under the state constitution or under the federal constitution? And so these tensions, you know, um, are legal and political in nature first and foremost, right? And so like, I think that's important to point out, but the only way you get to the, to un some kind of understanding is if you have a basic civics education, you know, uh, where you talk about what is tribal sovereignty, right? And what is state sovereignty? And this kind of boogeyman <laughs> of states' rights, right? Um, which goes back to the, the, the right of states essentially to enforce segregation in, Jim, in the Jim Crow South. That's where that term comes from. And we have to be honest. We can't sugarcoat it in any way. We can't say it's this or that. No, it comes from this specific history. And so when we talk about things like states' rights, we have to have a good solid civics understanding of where that kind of term comes from and where that movement comes from. It's not just used against indigenous people in the context of South Dakota. And so those are, I would always ask um, that you know, non-indigenous people and indigenous people, when we have these conversations, we define them according to the political and legal differences first and foremost, because as citizens of the state of South Dakota, you have an obligation to uphold your constitution, to not interfere and to not be aggressors towards tribal sovereignty. It's just, and then, you know, and, and as, you know, uh, people of this country, and we have an obligation to uphold the US constitution, which, you know, article six says, you know, treaties are the supreme law of the land. And so that's really what people at Standing Rock, that's really what tribal sovereignty in the 20th and 21st century has really been saying all along is to, you know, we have, you know, people of all political stripes, but more so on the right saying, you know, we need to go back to the US constitution and, you know, and some, and sometimes they'll say, well, treaties are old news, you know, that's an old document, um, broken promises. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry to say, but your constitution is much older than the treaties itself. <laughs> so, so if you want to talk about old documents, but at the same time, it's like we have these questions about constitutionalism, but a refusal in some ways to actually apply it to the very conditions of, of indigenous nations and how we entered into relations with the United States government. And so I always ask those conversations begin from that vantage point, first and foremost, and then we can talk about you know the other kind of issues because when we when we understand that issue we understand it through the lens of colonialism right um which is a big a big topic um and then more recently uh the the idea of settler colonialism which is essentially you know the united states isn't unique in this in the in the process of settler colonialism but it's essentially to give a brief definition of it it's taking a foreign invading population and trying to replace um, a native population with that population, you know, with a foreign invading population. Of course, in the United States, it's not just, you know, it's not like a, a binary between native and white uh, people. There's all, you know, it's a multicultural project. And so we have to take that into consideration. So it's not that easy, but nonetheless, it, it gives us a framework for understanding, you know, why we can have the name of a state called South Dakota but have little representation of the people where that name comes from, right? <laughs> or a misunderstanding of even the term Dakota, because I'm, I'm sure that many of us don't understand what that term means. You know, it's derivative of, of the word kola, which means friend, right? And so when we say Dakota or Lakota, we mean an alliance of friends, an alliance of, of, of good relatives, right? And we have to ask ourselves, is, has South Dakota lived up to that name? <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. I want to uh, ask the audience now to be thinking of uh, questions, comments, uh, insights that you have had relative to our conversation today. Because I think it's important that we find a way forward. And in so far as Nick's book is. To, for, from my understanding, is pointing us to search for that way forward. I think it's important for all of us to figure out not just what, quote, should be done, but what each of us can do, because it, it should no longer be an abstract thing 
that we say, oh, the state should do this, or the government should do this, or the church should do this. I think it always comes down to what do we do? What does, what could, can each of us do? Because we all ultimately make up those institutions. So we can't uh, sort of throw away our authority and our power by just sort of like assigning them to the committee <laughs> role to go do something and come back to us. So uh, with that in mind, Nick, can you tell us some things that you might think that, that we could do as a society or as individuals to, can I say, humanize the native people in our regular activities. And when I say humanize, what I mean is we can objectify people and have some abstract notion and deal with that objectification and never really have some kind of connection, a human connection to another human. We can say something about the tribes and some abstract thing, but it doesn't really, it's a placeholder in our heads and hearts. It never, to me, it often never materialized. So can you talk to us about some things you might've observed that people can, practical things that people can do to get the ball rolling in anyway? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm an educator, so my impulse is to always say to, you know, educate uh, yourself as well as others around you. Um, I think that the only reason you and I are having this conversation um, is because there is a water protector movement of which both you and I are, were a part of. You went to Sailing Rock. Yeah. Um, and you can say that, like, of all the programs that have existed, right, um, throughout history to educate, you know, regular Americans about the history of this country, um, there's something different about the moment of Standing Rock because I could go to Chicago, and which I did <laughs> during the, the movement. I had a, a brief one month fellowship at the, the Newberry Library, but as soon as I got off the airplane in September in 2016, I, went and began to organize um, solidarity uh, uh, rallies and, and you know caravans to Standing Rock in Chicago. And I didn't have to explain anything. I didn't say, have to say like, hello, I'm an indigenous person. Yes, we still exist. This is what <laughs> tribal sovereignty means. It was on the consciousness of people, on, like on their minds, right? And you could go almost anywhere in this country and people would be like, Standing Rock, like I understand that there's something, you know, and you can say that about the Black Lives Matter movement. You can say that about, you know, the, the, the Black freedom struggle in general at its, you know, at its height or like even the, the anti-war the anti movement and in, in during Vietnam and people would know what you were talking about. And so in some ways, there's only so much we can do as educators in like telling somebody to read a book. And I say this, you know, I say this in the, in the introduction of my, of my book, um, is, is, you know, knowledge alone has never ended imperialism, right? No. Okay. And so knowledge alone will never end oppression. Mm -hmm. But in this kind of interim, you know, like I, I think of, as a historian, I think of time as speeding up and slowing down in certain moments. Like when there are moments of protest and uprising, you know, during the George Floyd uprising, 26 million people participated in that one of the largest protest movements in history. Yes. In history. That's right. Like that's phenomenal, right? Yeah. And, and um, it was worldwide. <laughs> yeah, and it was worldwide, it was international, it wasn't just you know, confined to the United States. And those young people, mostly, you know, mostly young people who participated in it will never forget you know, what, like the, the knowledge that they gained, right? You can read a book about it, but until you experience it, it's something different. And so, I'm, there's, I guess there's an ask on both ends. One is to, yes, read things and engage, you know, in, in the tribal literary tradition, especially the Ochete Shakoi in South Dakota, you know, support organizations like the Oak Lake Writers Society. We have a website, you can check it out. We have a Native Reads program, which we identified 10 books from the Ochete Shakoi literary tradition. My colleague, um, Dr. Sarah Hernandez, put that together. We've also identified 250 books that Ochete Shakoi authors have written. 
So there's all these resources that you can you can you know you can go to, and I would recommend going to that you know that website and and utilizing those resources. There's podcasts, there's study, there's study guides. Teachers can teach them in the classroom. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, there's another ask, which would be to think about, you know, you and I as water protectors, it's not just an indigenous thing, right? This isn't just an indigenous issue. Everyone who walked through the gates at Standing Rock through security became a water protector, right? It's an identity that, sure, it's grounded in indigenous values and knowledge, but at the same time, it's it's not just an indigenous issue. It's not like a particular issue unto, unto ourselves. It's everybody's issue. And if we think about the impact of the water protector movement just within recent memory, there was a report that came back uh, from the Indigenous Environmental Network that was published um, the fall of last year. And it, it found that Indigenous-led movements against fossil fuel infrastructure were responsible for challenging 25% of the carbon emissions from Canada and the United States. That is a quantifiable like <laughs> gain, you know? And so on one hand, it's learn the history, go to these resources, use them in your classroom. The other, the other, the other, um, the other ask is to become a water protector. I want to open it up now to our other co-conspirators in this group for uh, any comments, questions, insights. Go ahead. Go ahead, Charles. Your mic is off, though. There you go. Now, now it's working. Hi, Nick. <laughs> Congratulations on having your book selected. I'm uh, really happy that that's, that's the case and that you will be uh, going around the state uh, talking about it. I think it's probably, uh, from my perspective, at least the best selection yet. That's saying something. Um, I was thinking when you were talking about what uh, students never hear and don't know, in my many years of teaching at SDSU, um, one of my first questions of my students uh, was, what does the word Dakota mean, in, as in South Dakota? Most of them were from South Dakota, and it was rare that any of them could tell me. Isn't that remarkable? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so that's just a comment. Um, here's a question. I still hear quite often the term post-colonial. Mm -hmm. um, would you speak to that and say something about uh, the ongoing use of it and uh, how you react to it? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, there's an Aboriginal Australian poet named Bobby Sykes who once said, when asked the same question, what do you think about the term post-colonialism? And she said, post-colonial, have they left yet? <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I think what you're talking about, um, Chuck, is a good, is a good, is a good question because it, it is a term that has risen in the academy that hasn't I think it applies to other parts of the world, uh, especially countries that have formally decolonized, meaning like, that term decolonize, decolonization is a very fraught term. Um, I used to teach a course on it uh, about indigenous decolonization and what it means for us, because in the context of, you know, of like countries like Ghana, for example, or, you know, South Africa or uh, Vietnam, when you say decolonization, or post-colonialism in those countries, they understand, oh, we had a war of liberation. Uh, we had to formally declare independence from France, from you know, Belgium, or from, from whatever European colonial power. And the problem of a settler colonial society like the United States, like Canada, like Australia, like New Zealand, is that when you say decolonization, 
the imposition of rule comes from the very land that is you know occupied by the government that is claiming authority over you and so there there raises all of these questions right and post-colonialism doesn't adequately describe the condition of indigenous people we are still housed in the department of interior which manages wildlife and natural resources right that's where we're at you know and you know uh god bless deb holland um, who is the Secretary of Interior, but we didn't vote for her, you know, as tribal nations. And yet she still has ultimate authority over indigenous people in this country, right? That is fundamentally, by definition, a colonial relationship between the United States and indigenous people. Nothing against the merits of Deb Holland in that pick. I'm just saying as an example. Um, Facts, not feelings, right? <laughs> um, um, but to think about how we get to something like post-colonial through a decolonization process is another question, right? And post there's post-colonial theory, but I don't think it adequately deals with indigenous people in our in our realities, right? Because you know we still are under constant erasure. Um, our lands are still being, you know, there still is ongoing historic injustices against indigenous people and nations. But I do think there are attempts in other parts of the world uh, to address these issues and to say that it's not about a one-to-one -one kind of comparison where you think, you know, even Bobby Sykes is, I like her saying, but it's provocative, right? It's not a, uh, it's not a solution, it's just provocative. It's to say, have they left yet, right? And, it, and I think, um, in the context of the US, there's larger questions about, you know, what it means to, to quote unquote, decolonize, right? To undo colonial relations. Um, and that's, we're not even near there, that question right now, especially with this government, even with Biden in power. Like I'm not, like it, 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 it doesn't matter. I'm like, I'm not trying to be like partisan. I'm not trying to say like, oh, Democrats or Republicans are better or worse because it doesn't matter who you put in those positions, this, the structure remains the same, right? And so if it's fundamentally baked into the cake of the United States, how do we unbake a cake, <laughs> you know? And that's the, that's the challenge that we're, we're confronted with. And um, I think like other countries, you know, going back to this notion, have begun to, to think about that it's not just this kind of, oh, when we say decolonize, do we, do we mean, that indigenous people are somehow going to do to white people what they did, what their ancestors did to us, because that's the fear, right? That's the fear that um, a lot of people put into the minds of other people. But I think it's very cynical to say that because it's never been the case of indigenous sovereignty, articulations of indigenous sovereignty, or indigenous nationhood. Uh, and in, and in fact, you can go back to, um, you know, the I'm not trying to paint the past as some something that was utopic, but you know, there was a, pl a plurality and a recognition and a, and a privileging of plurality that we simply don't see within Western liberal democracies that identify the citizen, the rights bearing citizen as the penultimate kind of goal and uh, objective of, of, of democracy versus seeing the rights of collective nations of people or groups of people or peoplehood, um, you know, as as kind of uh, fundamental. And I think Bindler Jr. said it best when he was, he said, there's a reason why Mexican Americans, African Americans and American Indians in this country have pushed this country to its limits. It's because we became citizens, not as individuals, but as groups of people, right? Mexican Americans were annexed uh, in, a, in, a, in a territorial war um, with Mexico when US annexed a third of uh, Northern Mexico uh, over the question of slavery because Texas wanted to keep the institution of slavery, but then expand it. Um, and then, of course, after the Civil War, the granting of citizenship to uh, African American people, and then, of course, the 1924 uh, citizenship of Indigenous people or American Indians. Um, and some would say that that was imposed, and it was in in, in many ways. But nonetheless, we became citizens of this country, not as individuals. We didn't immigrate and go through a naturalization process. We became citizens by fiat because we have a collective identity 
both in law, but also in our understanding of ourselves. And so that creates questions of the limits of Western liberal democracy that only allow for, I'm, I'm going way off topic, Chuck, so I'll, I'll just stop there, but it, it creates a certain set of questions that we might not be able to answer within the current legal framework you know, that exists. Well, well, I think you bring up a very important point, Nick, and that is that it may ultimately not be a legal problem. Hmm. Because if we don't feel differently about each other and about ourselves, then the legal part is just a manifestation of that inadequacy or those identity issues, how I feel about myself, how I feel about you, how I feel about whatever relationship we have. Those things just tend to be manifested in laws that we pass. So if we pass the laws or don't pass the laws, if our feelings don't change, if we don't change, nothing really changes as far mm -hmm. as I can see. Back to our group. Any other comments, questions? Uh, Nick, uh, Kevin Wooster here. That there's a sign that Indian Collective has here in Rapid City that says a big billboard, maybe you've seen it, uh, that says de decolonize. Mm -hmm. And a, a, a white male friend of mine, 50 ish comfortable, you know, in, in the community is not just put off by that sign. He's offended by it. And more than that, he's, he's, a, he's threatened by it. He feels threatened by it. He's not sure what it means, but he thinks it means bad news for him and for people like him. What would you say to him uh, about what that sign means and what message they're trying to send to the community? Well, equality might feel a, feel like oppression to some people. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know what to say other than that. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, it, it, I, I would say one of the things that, that I've observed, it's what I call the train yard effect. And when you're sitting in a train and one train moves forward, you can have a sense that you're moving backwards, even though your train's not moving. It may actually be moving forward, just not as fast. Because we tend to like determine our positions and who we are relative to others. And so if we've had a situation where we've enjoyed a certain privilege, and if we've enjoyed certain advantages, when other people get advantages, even if our advantage, even if the things we could do is still the same, if they couldn't do that before, somehow we can start to feel like we're losing. And I'm not sure what we can do about the human psyche that can help us to get over that. But it's not just, it's not just in, in, in relationships between people, just even in our physical relationships, we have a hard time with measurables. Back to my friend, if I may go back. Well, he's not a friend; he's an acquaintance. Uh, I think. Oh, he's now he's a, now he's an acquaintance. No, I'm just kidding. My wife told me beforehand: do not name him and do not identify him, because <laughs> I get to talking and go too far sometimes. But I think he sees it as we're going to lose our land. We're going to be kicked out of something. We're going to have something taken away from us. We're going to, you know, and, and I think he would say our land, uh, which you may dispute. Uh, but, but is there a way, do you give up on a guy like that and just say, you know, equality might feel like oppression to somebody like you? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't trying to be flippant, but I would just say that, like, I always find it interesting that it's, it's a question of, this person is fearing something that hasn't even happened, hasn't yet to ha been happening, and isn't going to happen, but he's not as upset about what has happened and what is continuing to happen, which is the fact that we've lost our livelihoods, we've lost our land. And so I'm always just like, it, it's, a, it's a, I mean, 
it goes back to what Lawrence is saying about a question of feelings, but it's also like, it's also the way that, you know, we've scaremongered a large section of this. I mean, racism operates through fear fundamentally. That's what it is. Yeah. And it's not so much about controlling people who are racialized or oppressed as it is about controlling white people first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know what to say other than, the, you know, like the fear, like this is, I mean, this is really, I mean, we're, this, this is a serious conversation. Like this is a serious conversation that I have with a lot of people. When you say things like indigenous people are, or there's a fear in your mind that indigenous people are going to do, or even brown people or, uh, you know, racialized people in general, black people are going to do to you what you've done to that, what your ancestors may have done to them. Um, there's an, first of all, there's an implicit acknowledgement, which I find interesting. I'm not a psychologist, so I'm sorry to psychoanalyze <laughs> this person I don't know, but there's an imp implicit acknowledgement that atrocities have occurred, which I find very fascinating, right? Very fascinating to me. And secondly, there's a projection that somehow those atrocities, even though they might have happened or are continuing to happen, that the person we should be most concerned about is the people who are, it might happen to in some imagined future, right? And I think that's a very irrational, fundamentally irrational response to this. Um, yeah, there's, we need to have community conversations, et cetera. But I also want to ask, you know, people who are in these situations, like when we say things like decolonize, or when we say things like land back, think about, who actually owns the land in South Dakota? Ted Turner owns 200,000 acres of Ocheti Shakoi Treaty territory. What does your friend have in common with Ted Turner? Exactly. You know, <laughs> like what does the, the average checker at Walmart have in common with somebody like Ted Turner? What do they have in common, you know, with people who have, you know, who continue to like, secure this wealth at, at the you know at the detriment to others you know and that's that's always my question it's like we're thinking about power you know um we're thinking about how it operates we're not thinking about the the person who may not have power right um and like i just yeah i don't know what i don't know what else to say it's just like it's i get like i understand like why that is the response because you've been conditioned to fear um, us, <laughs> you've been conditioned to fear. I mean, like the like the genocide of indigenous people within the, the context of the United States has been, you know, very thorough. You know, and and why why isn't that we're concerned about you know correcting those historic injustices? You know, that should be our primary concern. You know, and so like I don't I don't know what else to say to your your friend, but I like I get it, but I'm also just like. Uh, it's it's a very it, it mobilizes people to do very violent things um and i don't know how to address that but it also it kind of scares me a bit too sometimes because i'm like is that what they really think are they offended by a billboard that has literally done nothing to them exactly. but it, it creates such hostile resentment and reaction um that they may do something or they may behave in a certain way i'm not talking about you know um like certain things i'm saying like it prevents perhaps bills from getting passed or from policy from changing or, uh, you know, books being taught in the classroom. Like there are real material, we go, let's talk about censorship in this country. Like, let's talk about the way that those feelings are mobilized, um, not just to the detriment, you know, to uh, indigenous people, but to this person's children. You know, they're denying them an opportunity to to grapple with the history of this country and to 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 live in a correct way. <laughs> you know, you, you, like you made, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, that's all I want to say. You, you made a, a very important point, and I think it's uh, important not to skip over because I think it's very connected to the whole water thing and our interconnectedness with water. Is that the real goal of a lot of the in air quotes, white supremacy movement is really to control other, in air quotes, white people. Yeah. It's to make those, put those people in line by using other people as the boogeyman, right? It's kind of like, if you think of homelessness, we have plenty of 
materials and resources to provide homes for everyone. Why do we do that? Why do we have a whole bunch of people who have no homes? Why are homes priced out of range? It's because it's to keep those people in line who are, mm -hmm. who are the buffers between you know, them and those other people. It's just using people. It's mm -hmm. just manipulating those people. Right from the beginning, you read you know, uh, Zen's books, you know, it, it, right from the beginning, that was the whole point is to uh, manipulate the other white people into being afraid if you don't like if if you don't do right those people are going to take over and take everything from you those people exactly. are actually getting together but if you divide them and you keep them fighting and then they can just sort of like you use all your energy fighting those people and not realize who's taking everything from you eh? it's not it's not it's not those people why do people turn to poor people and say oh get those people off welfare but you give the corporations all kind of money Right. It's, it's human think, manipulating those people. <laughs> and I think, though, even in the book itself, like there are and I wish I would have spent more time on this, but, I, you know, trying to do a long history. I begin the book by talking about my friend Michael, who I went to high school with, this white kid, mm -hmm. you know, who joined the Standing Rock movement mm -hmm. as a water protector mm -hmm. because he's not like a rich, wealthy white kid. You know, he like but he he understood that this was you know, in, in some ways about a question of power. And, you know, we didn't turn them away and say, oh no, you can't be, you know, this is our, that's, that's ridiculous, right? That's ridiculous. And, you know, like we all drink water, yeah. you know, the, the Missouri River Basin, you know, supplies water to about 8 million people in this country, right? And if, if you want to side with corporate interests um, that threaten the integrity of that water, you yeah. know, um, over this question that like somehow indigenous people are angry, we're violent and we're gonna do something to you, that is gonna affect your water supply, you know? Like, and so I think that's also, I mean, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about this in, you know, uh, Black Reconstruction, where he talked about, you know, this he, is what he called the wages of whiteness. It was this idea that like reconstruction post-Civil War was this, you know, bad project, um, and it was against white people, but in fact, Reconstruction created what we now know as public education, which actually helped poor white kids in the South. Exactly. It, it helped poor white kids in the South, it integrated classrooms, it, you know, it promoted an, an equality in the South that the country hadn't, hadn't seen in history. So it was revolutionary. But come along, you know, the, the Ku Klux Klan and others, um, and these, you know, the segregationists mm -hmm. and saying that, you know, you shouldn't share the same interests as your, your black brethren, you know, and so they implemented Jim Crow to separate those and to destroy that project and to terrorize that project out of existence. And so my, you know, my goal with this book and, you know, with my scholarship in general is to show that like these moments, like even the Black Hills Alliance in 1980, White ranchers, white people, white farmers, white miners in the, the Miners for Safety in the Homestake Mine in South Dakota said that treaty rights fundamentally protect everyone's rights because they protect the water we all drink and the land we all live on. And in 1980, when multinational coal mining corporations, multinational uh, uranium mining corporations decided to create a national sacrifice area in what is now, you know, what we know as the Black Hills. They all understood that indigenous people and our treaty rights not only protected indigenous people and indigenous nations, but they protected everyone. The reason why half of South Dakota is not an irradiated wasteland is because of treaty rights and because of white people and native people and people of all races standing up against these multinational corporations. And those are the histories we should be foregrounding and talking about and ask yourself why you don't know about that history. One of the largest protests in South Dakota history was the Black Hills Alliance that brought together all these people, you know? Um, and you ask yourself why you don't know those histories and why, you know, this really what I'm trying to do in this, in this book and Standing Rock was also you know, part of that, it brought together, it wasn't just indigenous people, 
Black Lives Matter from Minneapolis came out. Black Lives Matter from Chicago came out. You know, you had uh, immigrant rights people coming. You had people coming from all across the nation. All yeah, people coming from Samoa. Samoa. <laughs> yeah, some of them coming from Samoa. So I think, um, yeah, I, I could go on and on, and we're kind of running out of time, but. <laughs> yeah. But but I think that those are, uh, those are important points, especially if we look for ways forward, is to start looking for what we have in common. Yeah. That's that that supersedes whatever imaginary differences that we we come up with, is that we have a lot of stuff that we can work on in common. And to me, that is the positive way forward. And. Unfortunately, we're not doing that. We, we often get stuck in commiserating without actually going forward to say, well, we can't do that right now, but we can do this. Let's do that. You know, let's, let's have some relationships and, that are built on something besides politics. You know, just uh, hang out, get to know some people as your friends instead of my Indian friend, you know, just my friend. You know how and and with all the respect and understanding and you would give to knowing any other friend about what they feel, how they feel, what their histories are. Do that. That mm -hmm. that seems like a reasonable a, a reasonable approach. But I think it starts with something you were saying before. It's like okay, here here are these connections that we have. We we would we've been doing things together. There's a model for this. Any other comments, questions? We're down to our last five minutes or so. Well, when how do how do people get the one book program to come to them, Jennifer? Well, I can certainly put a link in the chat, but if you go to our website, uh, sdhumanities.org, you will find some information and a way to sign up. There's a very small fee um, and, and we also can waive or um, change that based on your organization's uh, ability to pay. Um, but with that, we will send out copies of the book to you, as many as you need for your group. If you wish, we will also provide a scholar or discussion leader from our Speakers Bureau to help lead the conversation, or perhaps you have your own ideas about that. Um, and all of that information is available on sdhumanities.org. You can also, of course, call 605-688-6113, and we'll talk to you about that. What's that number again? That is 605-688-6113. Here I am, pitch person. And, and, and I should, as long as I'm talking, you know, Nick and I are hoping to put together, as uh, Chuck kind of mentioned earlier, uh, some stops around the state for Nick throughout uh, some parts of the summer and absolutely come to the South Dakota Festival of Books September 23rd through the 25th in Brookings this year. Nick will be giving a keynote or some kind of panel or something. We don't know yet, but it'll be wonderful. And it, that's kind of the culmination of the year of what we hope will be a lot of good discussions. Excellent, excellent. Any last words you have, Nick, for us? No, I just wanna say a uh, sincere thank you to both you, Lawrence and Jennifer um, for putting this on and South Dakota Humanities Council. I'm excited for this summer. Um, I'm hoping to make as many uh, book talks as I can. Um, and also, you know, if you're interested in some of this work and you want to learn more, of course, check out, you know, the, the One Book South Dakota guides, but also the Oak Lake Writers Society, which I mentioned earlier, and as well as um, some of the projects that we've been working on, uh, such as uh, Red Media, um, uh, which is an organization I'm a part of right now. So, but I think Thank you so much for taking the time and listening. Um, and I look forward to seeing some of you uh, hopefully in person this summer. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Well, I'm hoping that all of you will start to look into your personal lives and your personal habits. Talk to your friends. If you belong to writing groups, reading groups, uh, church groups, political groups, to bring this kind of information to those groups to start making those changes. If you go to your school board meeting, 
ask about it. Try to find the courage in the face of all of the other kinds of uh, message that, that we get to speak up for learning and having our young people learn about the actual history of the state and to struggle with those difficult issues. If school is not, if education is not about struggling with ourselves and understand, better understanding our fellow human beings and how we fit with them, what the heck is it about anyway? You know, it, 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 what's the point of learning, reading, writing, and arithmetic if it isn't to be better citizens and better human beings? There's no point as far as I can see. You know, unless we're turning over to the, the bot overlords, you know. <laughs> so with that, we'll see you all next week, same time, same station. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, everyone.